and UK astronomy. I mean, I think it's just a fundamental importance that we keep on asking questions in our field. It, it, it's such a, a trough to get into to assume that you've reached the limit of something. You, you've got to 150 solar masses. Um, the fact that we can't explain even 150 solar mass stars should not deter us from trying to find something even bigger. Because these, again, as Chris is saying, are asking the fundamental questions of what implication does this have for forming life, not just in, in our galaxy, but in other galaxies, and, and, and you know, how many planetary systems can possibly form in our galaxy and in other galaxies. Well, there it is. And the monster will lead you on to other great discoveries. Richard, thank you so much for coming down. We are truly grateful to you. Many thanks indeed. Well, interesting things are going to happen. We are coming in now into the start of the Perseid meteor shower. So let's go out into the garden and join Pete and Paul. <laughs> Hi, Paul. Hi, Pete. How's things? Fine, thank you. It's a lovely night. It is. It is a lovely August night here in Selsey, and that means one thing, the Perseid meteor shower. Of course. And of course, we know that a shower is caused by the Earth passing into the uh, debris of a comet. In this case, it's Swift-Tuttle, isn't it? It is. That's right. Comet Swift-Tuttle, which was discovered in 1862 by Lewis Swift and Horace Tuttle. What a wonderful name. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, a, a comet leaves a load of um, particles in its orbit, and as the Earth passes through the orbit of a comet, those particles which are known as meteoroids actually encounter the Earth. It's basically, as they come through the atmosphere, they compress the air in front of them and that heats the air up. The air is then able to put enough heat back to vaporise the front surface of the meteoroids and they give off light and you see that light given off as the meteor trail. And it's quite impressive sight, isn't it? Some of the big bright ones, the uh, trail can be very, very long indeed. When you get a big bright one, you also get a bit of a bonus sometimes as well, because there's enough ionization there, enough excitation of those atoms, that when the meteor trail has actually gone by, you're actually left with a column of glowing air behind. Which, which is called the meteor train. That's known as the meteor train. And you can see that um, sometimes left behind after a bright meteor. So when would be the best time to look at this, do you think? Well, the Perseids are actually active from the 23rd of July through to the 20th of August. And that's quite a long period, isn't it? It is, but it's only when you get right into the very centre, which centres this year on the night of the 12th, 13th of August, that you start to get some very good rates, up to 100 plus meteors an hour. But if it's cloudy and you miss that night, a couple of nights either side of that are also or normally pretty good. So it's worth looking really around the whole weekend, isn't it? Yeah. And of course you don't need much in the way of specialist equipment, do you, for observing meteors? I think this is one of the wonderful things. A, a comfortable chair, uh, some warm clothing perhaps? Well, the, the most essential thing you need to do, first of all, is to actually find a location which is dark without any stray lights. Well, here we are, Pete. We're dark adapted. We've got a beautiful view of the sky. I think out of all of the activities that the amateur astronomer can engage in, I think meteor observing is the most sociable. Mm. And I love to have friends around and we concentrate on particular areas of the sky and make observations of various meteors. It's a wonderful thing to do. That's right. You, you can either do it seriously, scientifically, or you can just go out and enjoy the wonders of the night sky. Now, the Perseids are called the Perseids because they appear to come from the direction of the constellation of Perseus, don't they? That's right. Basically, as the Earth travels through the debris stream left by Comet Swift-Tuttle, even though all the meteoroids in that stream are travelling effectively in parallel orbits, um, as they come through our atmosphere, a perspective effect makes it look as if they're all coming out from the same point in the sky, which is known as the, the shower radiant. Now, of course, the radiant itself isn't a good place to look for the meteors, is it? If you look at the summer triangle where the Milky Way passes through, that's a good place to look, around the constellation of Cygnus. But after that, as you go through until the dawn hours, if you're up that late, then switch your view round to, say, look at Pegasus, the flying horse. The peak of activity is on the night of the 12th, 13th of August. Now, there is actually a shift in the number of meteors you can see and the brightness of the meteors you see 
after midnight GMT. And the reason for that is quite simple, because before midnight GMT, the meteoroids actually have to play catch up with the Earth to actually enter the atmosphere. Yes, it is. But after midnight GMT, the Earth has turned round, so it's actually encountering the, the meteoroid particles head on. So they'll be brighter and more spectacular. There's a, a greater yeah. collision um, energy and they are brighter. Yeah, that's right. And uh, I like to lie out in August and just take in the beauty of the shower, but I know that you actually want to do some science. I do, I don't just want to lie here. And <laughs> I have here a very, very useful form. Uh, this comes from the meteor section of the British Astronomical Association. And on it, there's various columns for recording the time of your observation, uh, estimated brightness of the meteor, the constellation it comes in. And from this, we can deduce a lot of information, a lot of very useful information, like uh, count rates, which are very important, aren't they? That's right. I mean, if, if you've got the, the number of meteors which are coming down, which actually belong to the Perseid shower, you can actually use that data to work out a, a model, if you like, of the debris streams which are passing through. Well, of course, if you get tired of observing the Perseids, the bright planet Jupiter's making a comeback, isn't it? It rises before midnight now and is visible low down in the southeast sky, isn't it? It's unmissable, really. It's so bright. It's the brightest thing in and that the area. It's a yellow colour. It is, but uh, if you've got a, a telescope, say a 10 inch or larger, and you look at Jupiter on the early morning of the 14th of August, say from about 240 BST, um, you should be able to see the bright moon Europa approach the planet's disk. Now, what Europa will do, it'll actually catch up with Jupiter pass across the front of the disk and then exit off the other side. But as it does so, the great red spot should also be visible on the planet's oh, disk. Be interesting. And Europa should actually catch up with the great red spot or appear to catch up with the great red spot <laughs> and then pass across it. I really hope it's clear though. Yeah, so do I. Oh, there's one. Oh yeah. Well, let's hope for the Perseids. Indoors now for our news notes. Chris Linton and myself, and joined by Chris North from Cardiff. And first of all, the Planck Telescope. And uh, Chris, this is your province. Yes, the Planck Telescope was a, a satellite that was launched in May 2009, so it's been up there just over a year by now. Uh, and it, it started its observations in about August, and the first 10 months of observations have just been released uh, in this image. Now, the, the main thing you can see in this image is it's the entire sky it's flattened out into an oval. And the main thing you can see in it is our own galaxy, the Milky Way. It's a white strip across the centre, and then the, the blue wispy stuff above and below is much closer material, just above and below the plane of our galaxy, essentially above and below the Earth. The real thing that Planck's after, though, is actually visible on the top and bottom of this image. It's the red and yellow uh, mottled appearance. It's something called the cosmic microwave background. Now, this is microwave radiation uh, from the very, very early universe, from a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, and encoded in the pattern of the cosmic microwave background is lots of information about how the universe evolved in its earliest stages and also what the universe is made of, how much of it is mysterious dark matter and dark energy and, and so on. And so by looking at that information and being able to peer through the galaxy and, and work out what's the galaxy and what's the distant universe, Planck can make an excellent image of this uh, microwave background and establish some of these uh, numbers better than we know them at present. And astronomers like me get the Milky, a beautiful shot of the Milky Way and a lot of information about our galaxy as well, so everyone's Indeed. happy. In, in this image you can see an enormous span of time. You can see uh, some of the bits of our galaxy, there are stars forming right now and Planck is seeing that. Uh, and it's also seeing the very early universe, so it's, you know, it's 13.7 billion years all in one image. It's going well. Meanwhile now, back inside the solar system. We've had a total eclipse of the sun, visible from Easter Island. How I wish I'd been there. Yes, this was a tricky one. It only just made landfall. You could only see it from land right down in the very tip of South America. And I think probably this is the eclipse in the last 50 years that was seen by fewest people, yeah, right, yes. I would bet. Maybe some of the Antarctic ones. Uh, however, some people did make it down there. They're a very popular site, um, partly for convenience, but partly for the atmosphere, was Easter Island. And it must have been an amazing oh, experience yes. Quite to, incredible. to watch the moon pass in front of the sun from there. We have had some beautiful images back, as you can see. You can see the pearly white of the sun's corona, the, the outer atmosphere. Um, and actually a couple of prominences visible, the, the uh, purple flames reaching up above the moon's limb. So, so a beautiful eclipse. Um, sadly, I wasn't there. Maybe uh, the next one. I wish I'd seen it. Another thing, um, Rosetta Space Probe. It's um, 
past the asteroid with a T-shirt and sent back rather interesting pictures. Yes, this is fascinating. Rosetta, of course, is a, a, the European Space Agency's comet-chasing spacecraft. Yeah. It's on its way to comet churimekov gerasimenko and it will <laughs> chewy gooey to its friends, and it will arrive there in 2014. But on the way, it's passed actually the largest asteroid yet visited by... Yeah by any any spacecraft and it's an interesting world mm. it's got um, a large impact basin so a place where something's hit it and left a crater but also look at these this is a close-up from some of the images can you see these grooves that are on yes, there indeed. now they look rather familiar to me because they look rather like grooves that we see on phobos the moon of mars which yeah. is a captured asteroid and i don't think it's very well understood where those grooves come from but well i'm sure scientists who've only just got these images will be be pouring over them Another probe, of course, is Messenger, and that's concerned with Mercury. It now seems that Mercury may be in more active volcanically, rather later than we thought. Yes, really surprisingly late. Messenger's just complete, had its third flyby of Mercury back in 2009. Uh, it'll go into orbit yeah. around Mercury next year, and then we'll know more. But the results from this flyby have found a, a region uh, which is very fresh, by Mercurian standards anyway. It's a, a place called Rachmaninoff. Yes. named after the composer. Yes. Um, and it seems that this may have been laid down as recently as a couple of billion years I ago. Know. Now, that sounds like a long time ago, but most of Mercury is much older, oh, three, indeed. four billion years. So, so this is quite an interesting discovery. And I think when Messenger gets into orbit and we start getting really detailed pictures of most of yes. the surface, I think Mercury's got a few surprises oh, in store. Has, I'm sure. Another probe still working well is, of course, Cassini, orbiting Saturn and its moons. It's a special study of Titan, the world where the lakes of liquid methane, and one of these lakes is evaporating, but it doesn't mean it's going to be lost. No, this is just what summer on Titan is like, Patrick. So the lake in question is um, Ontario Lacus, down in the southern hemisphere. We're just past midsummer, but in the six years that Cassini's been there, the surface of the lake has actually dropped by a metre. We can measure that through uh, measurements done by Cassini as it flies past. Now, that methane will evaporate up into the atmosphere, presumably be carried elsewhere on Titan, and it will fall as rain, maybe in the northern hemisphere, which is uh, in the middle of winter. And so we're seeing a real methane cycle, just like you learned in school with water. Water evaporates on the Earth, and it rains, it flows down through... Uh, rivers to lakes and seas and then evaporates again and exactly the same process is happening on Titan. I think Titan must be rather a dismal world over the constant methane drizzle from the clouds above. Yeah, not very cheerful, but no. um, an incredibly interesting oh, yes. place. This mix of chemistry isn't something that happens anywhere else in the solar system. It may be uh, a little like the early Earth was. And so I think Titan's a really good laboratory for trying to understand what primitive chemistry on a planet, or in this case, a moon, looks like. And people are doing all sorts of experiments to work out exactly how we account for the chemistry we see, whether life could have formed with this mix of chemicals, um, and exactly how the methane moves from the lakes to the atmospheres. But you have to think, before Cassini got there, and before it dropped the Huygens probe down into Titan's clouds, we didn't even know what the surface of Titan was like. We didn't know if it was uh, co completely covered by an ocean, whether it was completely solid. And now we have this really dynamic world with rivers and lakes and rain. Uh, it, it's absolutely wonderful. It's a weird place. Then um, what about the snowballs in the ring? These are a shock too. Yes, absolutely. In fact, way out in the F ring, which is the outermost and most tenuous of Saturn's main rings, shepherded by a couple of small moons, so Prometheus and Pandora. And in particular, as Prometheus goes round the planet Saturn, you see uh, material yeah. in the F ring sloshing together, and it seems that sometimes it forms these little snowballs, maybe 12 miles across or something like that. Now, these may just disperse. After all, snowballs aren't particularly solid things. Or maybe this is the beginning of a process that would lead to forming a moon. And so you start off with one of these sloshy snowballs and it might collect other material and get bigger and bigger. And maybe some of the small moons that we see in Saturn's system formed this way. They probably did. And certainly Cassini had been a tremendous success. Chris, Chris, thank you very much. And when I come back next month, we'll be talking about Events on Jupiter. So until then, good night.
Dan Snow sets off on the first of his Norman walks here on BBC4 this evening at 10. That's here after another chance to see Britain's park story with Dan Cruikshank next.